In a year when much was uncertain, the pop charts were filled up to bursting. As my big country town for six months partied down and Michael Bolton came surging, resurgent. Newsflash people, it's May 29th, 1988 and Michael Bolton's back. Ah, shit. Well, that didn't make any sense, but whose poetry does anyway? Number 10, being the 10th number, the one before the 11th, was Tell It To My Heart by Taylor Dane, a well-crafted song belted out by a young lady with a big voice, bigger hair, and bigger lungs, but no idea how to do anything but holler at maximum volume. Does get some credit for being the first top 10 rock and roll Taylor. Getting further away from number 11, but incrementally closer to number 8, is this week's number 9, the future number 1, What a Wonderful World by Louis Armstrong. Recorded originally in 1967 in Las Vegas after Armstrong's midnight show at the Tropicana, the session was overseen by Bob Teal, a veteran jazz producer, and Larry Newton, president of ABC, Armstrong's record label. Newton apparently went totally mental when he found out that Armstrong and Teal were disobeying him and recording a slow ballad when he wanted a more Hello Dolly type song and he had to be manhandled out of the studio. This caused the session to run over length but because Newton was unlikely to increase the budget to cover it and no one felt like asking him, Armstrong forwent his usual recording fee and worked for scale allowing the guys to be paid some overtime. Newton blacklisted the record and it totally flopped, but in England it sailed effortlessly to number one, knocking Everlasting Love from The Love Affair off the top. In 1988 it was reissued with the Robin Williams vehicle Good Morning Vietnam. It sniffed again in the US and didn't chart at all in the UK, but spent a week here at number one at the beginning of July. Good Morning Vietnam was set in 1965, two years before the song was recorded. Things like that bother me more than they probably should. Eighth in precedent this week is Breakaway by Melbourne band Big Pig, a so-called funk ensemble that specialised in thundereth, polyrhythmic bashing on drums. Not especially to my taste, but pretty unique in terms of the top 40 we've seen so far. Big Pig went on to have three top 40 hits. The highlight of their career was having Breakaway used in the opening credits of Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. Strange things were indeed afoot at the Circle K. Seven is the utterly redundant and pathetic stutter rap by Morris Minor and the Majors. In the early days of hip hop, it was too frequently seen as mindless party music or a subject for parody by opportunistic white acts. Love him or hate him, at least Vanilla Ice was actually sincere in his curious attempts. This is base cynicism and borderline racist mockery of an emerging legitimate cultural voice. Not least to say how it must have sounded to people with speech impediments. This made number two. I feel vaguely dirty. Number six gives us more of everything that was wrong with the late 80s with bros. A boy band set around the dubious talents that could only happen in the late 80s look their vapid and over egg synth confections actually managed to land seven songs in the Australian Top 40 before falling to pieces a few years down the path. The tune here is vaguely familiar, but honestly, they're just another Millie Vanilli to me. Number five, Rick Astley is seen as a bit of a joke these days. He seems to take it in pretty good humour, and there were much more deserving targets of mockery and opprobrium on her about the charts at the time. He's in at number 5 this week with his version of the old Nat King Cold Chestnut When I Fall In Love. It held out for 4 weeks in the top 10 and 11 weeks in the top 40 all up. It was the last of Astley's 3 top 10s and he had 5 top 40 hits all up. Astley's still working today, he is in his personal life the most distressingly normal and unaffected of people and he doesn't appear to have aged in the last 35 years. Next time I see him I'll ask him what moisturiser he uses. Now it's time for hello and goodbye. The segment where we shake our heads at sadness at old friends departing and pretend like we like the new stuff coming in until we find it is really nice once the initial awkwardness is worn off. New this week is Tell It To My Heart, which comes from 16 to 10. When Will I Be Famous from 11 to 6. 
and what a wonderful world, a massive leap of 32 to 9. They replace I Found Someone by Cher, no great loss there. The nifty rev it up from the erstwhile talking head Jerry Harrison and the tuneful love in the first degree by Banana Rama who had a dozen top 40 hits and 15 if you count Live Aid and associated products and one of the very biggest was Love in the First Degree which dropped from number 9 to number 16. The number 1 record is at number 2 this week and has been for a while. It won't have to wait much longer. Now for our newest section, the trade up where we scour the top 10 for less than stellar tracks and replace them with great records that never made the top 10 at all. And there are three likely candidates this week. The Accursed Stutter Rap, the I Don't Care If It Did Spend Four Weeks at Number One, The Flame by Cheap Trick, one of the worst records we've ever featured here done by a great group. And I think we've all had enough of Michael Bolton, don't you? His terrible version of Dock of the Bay gets the boot. Now, in the lower gloomy rooms of the charts, we have Alphabet Street by Prince, which never got higher than 14. So let's use it to pretend that stutter rap never happened. Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark with the Harder Edge Dreaming unbelievably never got past number 33, so it can snuff out the flame. And one of the genuine loony cakes of pop music, Terence Trent Darby should have had a much more productive and successful career than he has, but forwent that honour, choosing instead to go totally mental. His excellent If You Let Me Stay only got to number 36. Sane, polite and professional as Michael Bolton might have been, he has to take a walk because Terence Trent Darby has it all over him here. It's number four. It's that man who's as mad as a bag full of badges, Terence Trent Darby with Sign Your Name. Another top, top hit. Eight weeks in the top 10 and 18 of the charts, this one was coming down from its peak of three. For all his undoubted talent, he only managed five top 40 hits and hasn't even hit the charts in 30 years, despite it churning out records fairly regularly. He's like the Macy Gray from back in the day, I guess. His first foot wrong was when he told a US interviewer his Introducing the Hardline album was the most important record since Sgt Pepper. That got their attention. Then his follow-up album, Neither Fish Nor Flesh, was less fish or flesh than it was rubbish. He banged out another couple of albums to diminishing returns before he changed his name to Sananda Maitreya and devoted his career to selling his music off his website and complaining that no one bought it. Who knows, maybe he'll make a comeback. Next, if you could guess, is number three. Yay! It's Michael Bolton. Yay! An utterly redundant cover of Otis Redding's Dock of the Bay. There are some people you shouldn't mess with or try to cover because you're just going to look stupid. And Otis is one of them. But then Michael Bolton was pretty much used to looking stupid at this point and he was also pretty used to sitting back and watching fat royalty checks roll in. Suffice to say, this is a classic song thoroughly Boltonized, and it was getting beyond a joke at this point. Number two, staying where it was last week, is The Flame by Cheap Trick, one of the, in my opinion, worst records we have ever seen at number one, which is where it'll be next week. Now, it might just be pandering to my prejudice, but Cheap Trick are a band with a job, and that job is to play high energy power pop as inheritors to the Kinks, the Box Tops, the Raspberries, or Big Star. This flaccid ballad, along with the appalling follow up, a cover of Don't Be Cruel, are the absolute nadir of a great band's otherwise sterling career. Perhaps someone was getting a divorce and they needed quick money from trashy hit singles, who knows? It spent four weeks at number one starting, as we said, next week, 13 weeks in the top 10 and 20 all up on the charts. According to my new hit algorithm, it's about the same size hit as Funky Town by Pseudo Echo, but not quite as big as Video Killed the Radio Star. But it isn't fit to lace their shoes as a record. It's Fast Fantastic World of well, this week sees an absence of good humour, good music, insight or rapier wit, but that doesn't mean we still don't live in a world of fantastic facts. 
The boomer this week is Louis Armstrong's What a Wonderful World, as mentioned, up 23 spots to number 9. The doomer is Nothing's Gonna Change My Love For You by Glenn Medeiros, which falls 14 places to number 48. Top Deb is the Pet Shop Boys, who never reached any particular level of stardom here in Australia with three tepid top tens, came in with Heart as the highest debutante this week at 38. It didn't do much after that, peaking at 18. And the longest hanger on in the top 40 this week was that record, Nothing's Gonna Change My Love, which had been on the charts for 27 weeks. In the USA, One More Try by George Michael was in the middle of a three-week run at the top. No record spent more than four weeks on top that year, and only one, Steve Winwood's faceless role with it, managed that long. In the UK, hoping against hope they may actually have a decent number one this time, I am again disappointed to find that the number one hit seems to be some kind of double-sided single, with wet, 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 singing with a little help from my friends, and Billy Bragg dolefully intoning She's Leaving Home on the B-side. My God. Why? This time last year, Top of the Local Pops was Slice of Heaven by Dave Dobbin, hardly a world beater, but the fact that it kept the hoodoo gurus off number one is unforgivable. Peering into the crystal ball of 1989, it's Eternal Flame by the Bangles, which knocked off the record that knocked the mighty Mike and Mechanics off number one. Oh, the humanity. And the number one album in town this week was Introducing the Hardline, according to Terran Trent Darby which is really quite a good album. It's a damn shame whatever went wrong in that guy's head. We can change the climate, just don't change this primate. It's Monty the Safety Monkey to get all funky and drum us into number one. Go ahead on, Mr. Music. Number one this week is, for the last of its five on top, Get Out of My Dreams, Get Into My Car by Billy Ocean. Deposing Kylie Minogue from the top spot, this one spent 12 weeks in the top 10 and had a chart life of 20 weeks. It's a fun, inoffensive song, carrying that sheeny Mutt Lang signature sound to it, absolutely smothered the radio. A fun video didn't hurt either. To date, this has been Billy Ocean's last Australian hit record. Well, there we have it. I've got to say, that was a pretty poor top 10 this week, and it did bring out the grumpier side in me. It wasn't really one of the more enjoyable ones to write. There's only so many ways you can say this record is trash. But fear not, because if the good lords are willing and the creeks don't rise, I'll be back with a fun and funky selection in a new presentation next week. Ish. Thank you.